Welcome to another episode of The Kitchen Table. I, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Larry Ramden of our town Board of Health, Health Inspector. Uh, this is our second episode and we're going to today, with Larry's knowledge, introduce our audience to the correct proper ways for serving summer foods, transporting, and barbecuing. Larry, what do we have on the table today? <laughs> well, we're going to talk about it from the time you go to the grocery because your food safety really starts then. So what do we do? Now, it's hot out, temperatures are in excess of 85 degrees out and we go to the supermarket. A lot of times what we do is we go to the supermarket and we have other things to do. So we go there, we put the food in the car and supermarket might be far away because we prefer to go somewhere else. For example, I know Jean had mentioned going up the Butcher Boy in North Andover. Right. That's a little hike um, to come back down, especially if you're going to meet traffic with all the road construction right. True. that's True. going on now. So what can we do? How about taking a cooler with you? Simple cooler to put your meats in, a couple of blocks of um, coolant. And that should hold your food until you get home. As soon as you get in the house, make sure you put it away properly. The other alternative is to buy immediately before you're ready to do your cookout. But I don't think anyone does no. that. No, so, because we're too busy preparing to go shopping right before. So that, well, I, mean, I don't want to say old technique of going grocery shopping every day for that evening meal, it is, it's gone. Yeah, but but it's, that it was a it's, a, it's a better way to, yeah. for food safety. Exactly, because the time between it leaves the supermarket and gets to your home mm -hmm. is not very long. Okay. Plus, you don't have to deal with a lot of thawing and um, freezing and things like that. So, your product comes from refrigeration, it's prepared right away. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question for me. Yes, I do. Do you recall in the last episode, uh, you started to talk about butter? Uh, and m my concern was a lot of times it doesn't necessarily have to be in the summertime, but even during winter, the se other seasons, I go into someone's home and they have butter that is left out on the kitchen table covered in a butter dish for two to three hours. Is that safety? Yes, it is. Yes, it okay, is. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> butter is made up of a lot of fat. And the concern with refrigeration of butter are two things. It's one, aesthetics, because your butter is going to remain, keep its form out there, but it's not going to be spreadable. Okay. <laughs> and it's to prevent the butter from becoming rancid. That's why we refrigerate butter, because if it stays out for too long, then the fats start to break down and it gets rancid, and you're going to have to throw it out anyway. But Now, what is too long? Out, I would say if your butter gets overly soft and then especially in this type of beautiful weather now, it's mm -hmm. going to melt so it's going to go so, spoil anyway. Right. Okay. So too long is really something that you need to look at with your butter. I would, you can bring it out, leave it on the table for a couple hours, put it back in. So you can it's, put it back in? Yes, you can. Okay. You okay. can. Okay. Okay. Because uh, even when you're doing, myself personally, when I'm doing baking and they call for uh, softened butter, mm -hmm. sometimes that can take an hour for the butter to soften. Yeah, a lot of people I know take their butter out the night before they bake, so it can be really okay. soft and mix in with the flour while they're baking. Okay. Because it does take a lot of time to blend back in. All right. Okay, so keeping butter out at room temperature is safe. Oh, great. I'm happy to hear that one. It's the fat. <laughs> butter has a very high fat content. It doesn't have a lot of protein or carbohydrate in it that will support microbial. All right, but it's like anything else. If someone were to have it out in the hot sun. It'll go rancid. It goes rancid. And that probably would be true. Now, Larry, uh, we had touched upon once before um, food that is prepped for a barbecue like we have mayo and sometimes they'll put eggs inside uh, a macaroni salad mm -hmm. or a potato salad. 
What are the safety features for transporting that? Do you prepare it at someone's home when you get there, bring the ingredients with you? You can do a couple of things. If you're going to prepare it at home and transport it to someone's cookout, put it in a container mm -hmm. and put some ice around it and keep okay. it cool. That's what you want to do. Or you can keep your ingredients cool and bring it to your site wherever you're going and toss it in there. Okay. It might be more practical to do it at home and just put some ice blocks around it mm -hmm. to keep it cool and bring it to where you're going. All you have to do is get a box, put a clear plastic bag in it, put your container, fill some ice around it, wrap it over in the box, tie the bag, cover it, and you have an instant disposable cooler. It's insulation. That's not ex exactly, right. and it's not expensive. You can also wrap with some newspaper Oh, all yeah, around I've the box, that. put layers of newspaper I've around. I've done that yes, I've you the that boy. Yeah. <laughs> now, one other thing, and I don't know if, if it would melt too quick. What I have done is I have a large um, stainless steel bowl. bowl. So I can p put my crushed ice, and then I've already prepared, say, my um, potato salad. Take yep. it out and Make drop an ice it bath. in. And okay. We're going to get into that because oh, okay. we're going to be talking about those things so great okay what we need to do is let's think about what we're doing in a little sequence so we went shopping we bought our meats we bought our ingredients we've gotten a cooler we have some insulated bags or something mm -hmm. that we have our cold products in we bring it in we put it in the house we prepare it overnight so what do we do are we going to be marinating anything so we marinate it, we put it in a bag, put it back in the refrigerator. The refrigerator is working properly, just as it was, we mentioned the last time. Double check your refrigerators, keep a thermometer in there, make sure it's running below 41 degrees. Oh, okay. Comes out. So we're ready to cook. You okay. bring it out. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with that marinade? Nothing. When you take the meat out of it, marinade becomes trash because remember, you have raw meat in that marinade. So that should not be used as a should basting. Should not be used as a baste because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking bacteria from that raw meat and you're going to be putting it on your cooked product and then okay. you're going to get your guests sick because that bacteria may not be killed by the heat of the grill. Really? So that means if people have been doing this, this is really a no-no. It's an unsafe practice. Some people would take um, the marinade and then mix it in with barbecue sauce and leave it there and then people slather it on their burgers. I've seen it happen. So then you have all of the juice, juice. from the meat and the bacteria sitting there. Exactly. Okay. And you can get someone sick with it. Now remember, you didn't invite your friends over to give them salmonella. You invited them over to give them food. Okay, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> so. Okay. Now, when we purchase that meat and we we have it home, we had talked about chicken and beef. Rinsing chicken and and rinsing your meats out in a mixture of. Um, vinegar or lemon juice and salt. So that's both beef and poultry? All meat because what it does, remember during the slaughtering practice, although they're doing a lot of testing and our meat industry is doing a lot more testing than they were ever before because the USDA in I believe 1998 had all their meat plants following HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points, what they were expected to do is anticipate problems. And when they anticipated those problems, put a control in place to prevent it from happening. Things happen. But what we need to do, we also have to take our precautions because bacteria are very, very small and they may test and it may not be present in the test sample, but it's present somewhere else. We should take whatever precautions we can. If you take the surface bacteria off by doing the acylated sodium chloride rinse, as mm -hmm. they call it, or I just say lime and salt. Lime and salt. Now, lime is there salt. any percentage or um, 
tablespoon size of salt? Um, if you use about uh, a quart bowl of water, mm -hmm. you probably need about maybe two tablespoons of lemon juice to about a oh, teaspoon okay. Okay. of salt and that's about it it's not much you just mix in the water and the salt and the lemon juice together and then you just rinse your meat so in the it. lemon juice is causing acid acidity yes it's reacting with the salt and okay. it's lowering it's um, lowering the water acid and you're making a mild acid in the water okay i've just learned something because i have always i was raised that you would soak your raw chicken before you use it in salt to make a salt and water i was raised the same way and i couldn't figure it out until i was reading a journal one day and it said to me as i mentioned in the last program acidulated sodium chloride i said wow this is interesting and i, I started <laughs> laughing because it was exactly what my grandparents did what my parents did and what i was taught to do. we didn't know the science I behind it why I and yes someone read it and they said okay you're lowering the ph which is going to lower the surface bacteria and kill them okay. off. So okay. So the practice was a good one. We just didn't know just the science know. behind okay. what we were doing. So what we need to do is we need to look at how we're going to set up where we're going to cook. I've, I've said before that the most dangerous thing on a cook are their hands. So what we need to do is make sure that you have some type of hand washing available because it's not convenient to be running in and out to the sinks in the house to wash your hands and then we're going to be handling a lot of raw food we're going to be handling some foods that are being cooked to a lower temperature for example okay. we'll be doing chicken and then we'll be doing hot dogs and hamburgers so how do we really move back and forth while we're handling it the other thing I want people to think about is you need to set up your bag or your cooler if you're going to bring the food out in a container Put the thing that's going to be cooked to the highest temperature at the bottom. So the thing at the bottom is always going to be your poultry, followed by your ground meat. So your poultry, your chicken at the bottom, then you separate it with a layer of ice or something else. Then you put in your hamburger. And at the top, you put your hot dogs. And if you have fish or your steaks, they go at the top because they're all cooked to the same temperature. Okay. Steak, hot dogs unless you're making your own sausages. If you're making your own sausages, then your sausages have, should be cooked up to 155 degrees. If you're buying sausages out of the supermarket, it's still 155 degrees because okay. it's ground meat. So mm -hmm. anything that's ground has to be. If you're buying turkey sausages, remember, turkey is poultry, chicken is poultry. There's a lot of chicken and turkey sausages out there. If you're buying those, cook them to 100 and 65 degrees it doesn't have because it's it, the poultry part. exactly it's the poultry so we're gonna talk about setting up so you set up your cooler that way you bring it out you make sure you have your utensils in place and we've made a solution of sanitizing our sanitizing solution here all you do is you take your sanitizer and you give it a quick wipe you rest it down Make sure that you've done that previously too with all your surfaces. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry, um, when you have completed your barbecuing and you've cleaned your utensils, sometimes, you know, like they do have these little hooks here at the end of your barbecue um, surface to hang your utensils. But I've seen and I have done this in the past, and I know it's a no-no. You leave it out there until your next barbecue, and then you just rinse it. Well, let's think about it. Would you do that with your utensils in the house? Would you have people over to the dinner and then just leave the dishes dirty Absolutely until not. Yeah. your guests come back? No, because it's going to go karate. It's going to allow bacteria to go it's going to provide food for pests to come all the little bugs are going to come mm -hmm. looking for food mm -hmm. so if you clean your equipment after clean right after right and after. immediately before and immediately after because you don't know what's happening in storage okay and that holds true with your grills yeah okay now setting up um washing you have 
a little bit of hand soap, your water. And I like something with a pull spigot because I find it difficult to push my hand against a cooler and try to wash one hand and then hold and rinse the other. It just doesn't work because the whole process of hand washing involves the friction uh -huh. to remove the bacteria on the surface. So you have to really rub together to remove whatever's on your hand. I'm not going to simulate it, but when you do wet your hands, in fact, I'm going to do it, and you lather for 20 seconds. You said the last time you sing happy birthday. Happy birthday, the alphabet, <laughs> whatever. So, actually, if you're going to be barbecuing and you're having a group come in, you almost need to set up a mini little kitchen out That is exactly it because you have okay. your, your grilling area is your kitchen. You are wherever you're cooking, that's your kitchen. So it and is a good idea then. Uh, I have seen them in catalogs. They'll sell these outdoor counter cabinets. Mm -hmm. That If you can afford one of those, by all means. I've looked, I've been out to Costco recently and they have a fantastic grill that I told my wife, I said, this is my dream. <laughs> it has sinks, it has oh, a refrigerator, wow. it has everything that you could want, a full kitchen outdoors. So says, you like to cook, you like, yeah. I love to cook, she says, in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'll keep dreaming. So you have to improvise. Yes, and look, we improvise. Yeah, I, I liked what you did. We took a clay pot, plastic bag, now I have a trash container. Okay, super. We use things right around the yard. So we washed our hands, and yes, I know I picked up the pot, so I should wash my hands before no. I start handling the All food. Right. Remember, hands are the most dangerous things you have. They will, hands travel. They pick everything up, and then they'll put it on the food. So we've talked about cooking the food, of course, I always wear my trusty apron. And why do you suggest an apron, Mary? Well, a lot of people think the apron is in, the apron does two things. It protects you from being stained. Mm -hmm. But more than anything else, it protects the food from you. Oh, okay. When you got up this morning and you changed, you did a lot. Whatever you did came in contact with your clothes and it's on your clothing. And that is going to get onto the food Ooh. while you're cooking. And then I'm noticing the baseball hat. Yeah, I always wear a hat because aesthetics and I don't want my hair getting into my guest food. Mm -hmm. Okay. While there have been little evidence to show that um, there's been much direct control, but we have bacteria. Yesterday there was a study, in fact I was looking at the television last night, there was a study showing that our skin has over 200 different species of bacteria on them. 200? Yeah, 200 different types of bacteria living on our skin. Wow. And those will get into the food. Okay, so the apron has a dual purpose. Yes, it's to protect us our clothing from getting stained and the food from getting whatever's on our clothing okay. on it. A um, couple of tools I have. Digital thermometer. I like a digital for outdoor grilling for one single reason. The regular thermometer that we, we used the last I showed show. you the last yeah. time yeah. is great for indoor cooking but since you have to put it up to this dimple. That's an awful deep area. Okay, I have to put, Plus the, it's a put my glasses on for this one. On the fatter side. Okay. So to get this into a hamburger, it'll fall no. apart. Yeah. You All won't right. be able to take the temperature on a hamburger. Or a, a, true, a true cut of temperature meat. then. Yes. The digital oh. thermometer has a smaller tip. So you can use this and it reads directly from the tip, whereas this has to be put up, up to the dimple. Oh, okay. Otherwise it's not going to read properly. That's why I prefer. And digital thermometers are easily available at just about every um, hardware or home goods mm -hmm. place. 
where you get your kitchen And you supplies. suggest the digital for the outdoor Yeah, barbecue. and they're not expensive. One of these will probably run you about $10. Which is worth it for safety. Yeah, and I've had this with the same battery in it for the last seven years. Wow. This little trusty tool here is a grill thermometer. And what, how do we use it? If you look at the disc here, this tip is a tip that reads the temperature. And this disc prevents it from going too far. So you stick it in and it stays right there. So you just would stick it in all yep. that much into the meat? Yep, that's all you need. And your on and off switches right here. Mm -hmm. So you turn on and off. So you just turn on, read, turn off. So you can check every single cut. Last week it was my son's graduation and I was drilling up a storm. I, every single piece of meat was checked with this. Any particular brand that you recommend? Um, if people Google grilling thermometers, then they will see this one. I bought this at China Fair in Newton, on Needham Street in Newton. Okay. I bought this there. Um, I know it's available there. It goes for about $18 there. I've seen it on the internet in excess of $40. And wow. I know China Fair has a website, so if people want to go on and check, get, it, out check and it out, then they can do that. But I, this is my favorite tool when I'm grilling. So that, you would use that for? I use it for everything. Beef, Beef poultry. Or poultry. And what, just remember, in between your species, that's why we keep the sanitizer handy. Every okay. time you check a different type, all you have to do, sanitize So if you were checking your, your, your poultry, you rinse, clean that, and then you check your beef. Right. Do not go consistently. Right. What I do is when I'm cooking, is I cook from lowest stem to highest stem. So I start with my hot dogs first, then my steaks, then I go to my hamburgers, and the last thing that goes on the grill is my chicken. All right. Now when you, the usual is when you're grilling all right who wants a hamburger together. who wants chicken does this one section for your hamburger your patties and then there's your chicken you suggest not to do that what if you have an upper rack and a lower rack cook your hot dogs on the upper rack cook your chicken or cook your hamburgers on the upper rack and cook your chicken on the lower rack okay so okay. it's just like you would in your refrigerator product that's going to be cooked to the highest temperature, put it the lowest, product that's going to be cooked to the high. The reason why I do that too is you can't feed everyone off the grill. That's why I cook ahead of time. And I set up my warmers, put some sternos in, you have the first pan, put boiling water. So we got some boiling water okay. here and you fill the boiling water in the pan. Because what it's going to do here is that you don't want your sternos to be heating up cold water because it's not going to heat up enough. But we don't, uh, for, the, for the audience to know, we don't have sternos no. in here right now. Oh, this is just for this demonstration. This is for demonstration. So you pour boiling water and your sternos are going so it's already hot. It's just maintaining the temperature of the water. And then you put your pan in and you put your food in cover over it so it's going to maintain the temperature until your guests are ready. Same thing if you're going to be using cold food. Just as we talked earlier, you were asking about putting the salads right, out. Right. Yes. Take a larger dish, fill it with ice and then put the smaller container with your salads in that. So what you've done is you've created an ice bath. Remember, you want to keep your hot foods hot and your cold foods cold. And it does work because I've just done it and food that I had out. And it's not because I'm a professional in this, but because it works. It does. Now, what about, There's no real what about science covering to it. these items? Now, we have our bath, we put in our potato salad and our macaroni salad. We need to keep it covered, should we not? Yes. And 
that's all you do. You just put them in, okay. get some ice around the sides, mm -hmm. and then cover it. There are a number of different covers out there. You can buy the pop-up covers right. and cover it. There are foil covers that you can put on them. Some people go into the more expensive chafing dishes. A simple stainless steel bowl with another bowl in it with the ice, ice around, around it, it and plastic wrap is just as good okay. as those. Now, you can also take a big cooler oh. or a box. Just remember we talked about right, the box and right. the ice yes. that you would bring from the supermarket. You can do the same thing. Take a plastic bag, line your box with it and fill that with ice. Pop the containers of your cold foods in it, then pour the ice around it. And if you just take some nice decorative paper, you've made an instant cooler. Well, you know, that's, very, uh, that's a very good tip for our audience because you don't have to go out and buy all this elaborate no, equipment. You don't. I mean, you could even take that box and take your, uh, a dish towel or something yeah. and wrap it around mm -hmm. it. And that would also be a good thing because if it starts to melt, you have something absorbing so, that. Exactly. So safety is not necessarily running out and purchasing oh, safety, all this equipment. Exactly. It's using um, techniques right. to prevent. 90% of food safety is common sense. Okay. Being innovative, understanding what the problem is that you want to solve. Once you understand what you want to solve, you can come up with a number of solutions for it. Okay, okay. Now, the other thing that was brought to mind with this, these can be disposed of. Yes. A lot of us like to use them. Foil containers are not intended to be reused because there are too many seams in here. And that could become a bacteria haven. You got it. Okay, okay. Well, Larry, what about you're serving food to your guests, you have beverage. Are there any beverages that we should be more concerned about? I mean, the soda pop, uh, keep it on ice. If you have, if your beverage comes from the store, if you buy it from the refrigerated case in the store mm -hmm. and it has to be refrigerated, then make sure it's kept refrigerated. Oh, once it's cold. Yeah. Keep it cold. Keep it cold. Okay. A lot of things we want to keep cold, so we take our soda and other beverages and to get them cold and put it in the ice. Those are not necessarily have to be cold, but for comfort and pleasure, we keep them cold. Um, making an ice bath for cream. Okay. Because we, after a good meal, everyone says, what about some coffee? Mm-hmm. And... Of course, we all want cream with our coffee or our tea. Put it in some ice, and you can make a similar ice bath as you would for the salads. Put it there. Get a small box, put some ice in it, mm -hmm. and then put your containers of cream in there. Okay. Um, I, when I have cookouts, I don't buy the big. It's more cost efficient to buy the big ones, but it's not as safe to buy them. So I buy the um, half pints. Half pints. Or the pints and put them out. It's easier. And at the end of the day, it's done. It's done, and you don't. Then you're not throwing out what you save purchasing exactly. it. You're losing because you have to store it. Yeah. Because yeah. remember, every time you keep it in your refrigerator, whatever it's costing you to run that refrigerator, mm -hmm. it increases the cost of that m milk or right. cream that you bought. Right. And then if you ha if it's been out too long, and you have to discard it, exactly. you're still losing. Now, is there any suggestions? People sometimes. When I say people, the general families, they'll say, well, let me make a batch of ice cubes for our drinks. Mm -hmm. And they'll put them in a bowl. And sometimes people like to go with their fingers. Absolutely not. Thank Worst you. practice in the world. Okay. Remember what we said? Hands are dangerous. Okay. Pair of tongs. Okay. Tongs are very cheap. So put right. that Plastic right next tongs, to your... Put it in it. In it? All right. Put it in it because people will miss it. Okay. Okay. And whatever you do, I, one of my pet peeves is when you go out, the vegetable platter comes out and there's a beautiful dip in the middle and everyone's dipping into it. But then they dip and then someone bites into it. Wow, this is a great dip and they go back in. That's a no-no. Yeah, we all know double dipping is not, not yeah. permitted, but it, it happens. happens. It happens. 
What I like to do is put a spoon in, in your dip. And when people come to, they will take up their salads or their vegetables and then just dip some out. Put Have little paper plates or yeah, something. And that then you just put it there. in your plate so you can walk around with your own share of dip that you don't have to give to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And you're not contaminating it for anyone else. Okay. Okay. These are great tips. Great knowledge. Now, we're talking about barbecue. We're going off to the beach. Mm -hmm. I have my cooler ready to go. Is there any uh, sequence for putting sandwiches in, fruit in to a cooler? If it's all cooked, you don't really have to worry about the sequence. Okay. So if it's cooked, you're okay. The only thing I recommend is get some of these ice blocks. <coughs> these maintain temperature well and I line the bottom and the sides of my bags when I am traveling. Some of these bags come with their own insulation. For example, it may come with a sheet like this mm -hmm. that you just stick in your freezer. Just make sure that it is prepared. And the way I pack it is pack according to how you're going to be eating. So the thing that you're going to be eating first goes in last. The thing that you're going to be eating last goes in first. Okay. So you're not digging around your cooler. And if you use ice cubes in a cooler, you know, sometimes people throw ice cubes on top. They have their ice block and this drips down. That's bacteria. Am I right on it, that? You, it is going to support bacteria because the moisture will cause bacteria to grow. But it all depends on what you have in there. If you have your sandwiches and they're wrapped in light plastic and they're going to get moist and it's going to transfer it, and what you probably need to do is put a layer of plastic over okay. the ice blocks. All right. Do that. What about making ice cubes? and putting them in your, you know, you have little ice cube trays and I'm gonna make ice cubes, put them in my freezer. Is there any precaution? Do you rinse that tray out, soap and water, rinse it out before you do another batch of ice cubes? Uh, no, not really because you're moving from just emptying it out, putting it in a bag and then you're filling water. And putting, it, freezing putting it, it back in. Okay. Unless you think that while it was in there, you had some raw meats go into the freezer and it came in contact oh, with, with okay. it. But always remember, when you're putting meats in, you always put it below things that you're not going to cook any further. And ice, you don't cook ice. All right, so let's you always talk, store everything below ice. Let's talk about the freezer. I just came in from purchasing meats. Mm -hmm. And I want to freeze my poultry. I want to freeze my lamb chops. How do you stack them? The same as you do Yes. your cooler. Exactly. Chicken on the bottom. Chicken on the bottom. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Remember, it's always the thing that's going to be cooked to the highest temperature, you always store at the bottom. Okay. So it's in a descending order. The lower your temperature, the higher. So you put your hot dogs at the top, followed by your steaks, your fish, then your hamburger, and okay. your poultry. So right. your lamb chops will go above your hamburger. What about defrosting? Defrosting, do your defrosting in the refrigerator. If you know you're going to be cooking a few days, take it out, put it in the refrigerator. You can also defrost on the running water. Get your water up to about 70 degrees, put it in a bowl, fill the bowl up with water, and then have the water running at a very, very slow pace. So if I can show you here. Mm -hmm. That's about all you all you need. That's a piece of water you want running because what it'll do, it'll create a current in there and keep changing your water out. You can also defrost in the microwave. But if you're going to defrost in the microwave, as soon as it comes out of the microwave, it goes onto the grill. Okay. Or it's going to be served. Don't defrost in the microwave and leave. The reason for that is you've just brought that up into the danger zone where bacteria will grow. 
In the microwave? In the microwave. So when it's defrosted and it's in that zone and you leave it out, then that bacteria is going to start growing rapidly. So if you've put something in the microwave, and I'm saying even if you're cooking, mm -hmm. and you know how sometimes your microwave will get these beads of moisture? Mm -hmm. You wipe it out, wipe it off, because that will create... Yeah. Oh, we have to use our sanitizer. Yeah. Okay. Just sanitize the inside. So that should be something on a routine basis. Yeah. That your microwave, like anything else in your kitchen, should be cleaned daily. Okay. Back to the grill. Cleaning it after, is it that, it, do you take the grill into the kitchen, scrub it in the sink? Yeah and then bring it out or do you leave it, would you suggest leaving it and store it in a ca kitchen cabinet and then use it again? It all depends on your grill type. I normally take my grill top off, wash it out and oil it and put it back on because I have a cast iron top. You can leave it there. Once it's cleaned up, put it back on, cover it and it should okay. be good. Okay. But one of the things I needed to talk about with the grill too is before people start grilling what they need to do just from a safety aspect is they need to look at their surroundings where is this grill located is it 10 feet away from the house because you don't want the heat from the house ruining the shingles or catching him a fire that's a very good point because a lot of people keep because they want to even grill during the winter mm -hmm. they keep the grills on their decks and it's right hugging the house right and that can that's a safety the grill, issue yes, yes. So people need to be aware of that. Um, what is it located next to? What can get into it? Mix some soap and water and rub the hoses down with it and turn your gas on. If you see it bubbling, mm -hmm. then you'll know that there's a leak in your gas line. So you need to replace your gas line, rubber lines, because those can become brittle. Okay. And then you want to grill the meats, you don't want to grill yourself. Yes, <laughs> yes. The thing I wanted to talk about was leftovers. Oh, you know, after, after I never know what to do with leftovers. leftovers. It's no different than taking the foods in or transporting the foods. Make yourself some little coolers to take it back home. Okay. There are beautiful gallon bags out there, storage bags, plastic storage bags. You put them in the plastic storage bags, the freezer bags. Mm -hmm. Put your food in a freezer bag, wrap it, get all the air out, seal it, and put it in a container with some ice. Those bags hold very well. Nothing gets into them, so okay. the seal is very tight. Then you wrap it up, make a makeshift cooler, just as we had spoken right. earlier. Okay. And then you can transport it home. Get the um, food inside. Now, if your food has been sitting out, now during regular times you can keep some things out I would say for about two hours and then get rid of it so if you have a lot of food don't bring it all out keep it inside in the refrigerator and as the amounts go down then keep replenishing uh, what about um, and if your foods have been out for a long time they're gone yeah they're, yeah you're grilling I just brought out the hamburgers on a platter that platter stays there or it goes back to be rinsed to have the cooked hamburgers put on it? It can go back to be washed and cleaned properly for the cooked hamburgers. What I like to do is I use a two table setup when I'm cooking mm -hmm. where my raw foods come in on one side okay, and it goes to cooked. Oh. So cooked and raw will never meet. So everything comes from one side. There's a flow keeps flowing. All right. So anything that's on this side stays on this side. So a clean plate should be on this side. You clean on one side and your raw is on the other. So you have all your cooked food on one side. Don't mix your cooked and your raw together because it's going to get contaminated. This is a lot of information. If our audience should have any questions, Larry, how do they go about getting answers? Well, USDA has a wonderful 
handout online that they've put up. Okay. It's barbecue and food safety. I'm going to post it on our website. Wonderful. And people can go to the health department's website and get it. This and is Redding's? Yes. Great information. I, I did browse through this. And it goes through, it's a very simple explanation on all the all safety it. things that you can take <coughs> mm -hmm. to ensure that your barbecues are successful, what you need to do, because they talk about pre, before you're buying, how you're thawing, marinating, transporting, keeping your foods cold, keeping things clean, doing dealing with your leftovers. It, pre-cooking. So this is... This is your outdoor cooking food safety 101 yes. handout. Okay. Is there anything else you I could give us for knowledge today? Just remember, safe food is... Keeping food safe is simple. If you follow some very simple techniques, keep raw foods separate from cooked foods. Make sure that your hands are always clean and if your foods are cold, keep them below 41 degrees. If your foods are hot, keep them above 140. If you follow those simple rules, everything should be okay. Well, I look forward to this barbecue season because I have a lot more knowledge now. Thank you so, so much. It's a pleasure. Anytime. Our pleasure. Thank you again. And we're going to probably be doing another segment later in the fall for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And how to prepare that turkey and the do's and the don'ts for safety issues. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to another episode with The Kitchen Table.